good morning, everyone, and welcome to Go Engineers Webcast Marathon Day. If you're joining us for this first uh, webcast uh, this morning, uh, this is one of several that we're showing throughout the day. So if you're interested in other products, wherever you signed up for this one, you'll see um, all the others as well. Um, while we uh, just kind of give everyone some time to uh, get logged in and stuff, I'm going to go through some um, just just little setup stuff for you guys. Um, you're all muted, so if you're going to expect to speak to me and ask me questions, that's not going to work. Uh, what you want to do is, um, at the end of the session, I'll have a little bit of time to answer some of your questions, and you can type them in in the questions area. I'm kind of showing up on the screen here what that should look like for you. So you can type your stuff in there. I'll try and answer it. Or, um, you know, if we don't get to answering those questions, make sure you jot down my email address there, and you can send me an email. So anyway, that's me, uh, Mark Sheets, Applications Engineer for Go Engineer. I'm out here on the West Coast, and I'm going to get us started today. Uh, the topic is, as you can see, and it, of course you signed up for it, Design Like a SolidWorks Wizard. Um, just to cover quickly the other topics that we're covering today in, uh, in the um, sessions following this one, we're going to cover things like um, electronic design applications with Altium. Uh, we'll have enterprise PDM session, uh, simulation, as well as CamWorks, uh, Stratasys 3D printing, and as well as 3D via composers. So if you have any interest in those other products, you think they might be able to help you out, Go ahead and uh, join us uh, later for those uh, those topics as well. Like I said, we're doing a ba basically a webcast marathon today, and I'm going to get things kick-started here real soon. So my agenda is pretty simple. It's going to be a SolidWorks demonstration, and I know that a lot of you out there are already using SolidWorks, so I thought would be what would be most beneficial to show in a SolidWorks demonstration are all the little tips and tricks that make you quicker with SolidWorks and more productive. Uh, very oftentimes we do presentations or we come on site and um, we're showing pieces of software in a big presentation with a large audience. People are always approaching me afterwards and saying, hey, how did you do that thing? How did you get to that menu so quickly? And you're doing some things on there I haven't seen before. So those are some of the things that we want to show today. Uh, then at the end, we've got some prom promotional announcements that we want to make sure you're all aware of. There's some great deals going on this month, and we're getting kind of near the end of the month. And then, like I said, we'll have some Q&A at the end. So some of the things I'm going to cover here is um, starting out with a new design. Oftentimes, your new designs begin not just within your seller's screen, but they begin when you just have an idea and you jot it down on paper, or you're at a meeting and you guys scribble something down. Um, we can actually take advantage of just a hand sketch drawing, bring it into SolidWorks and begin a new design from that. Or if, um, if you're just trying to bring a, an image in, let's say, of uh, something that looks like uh, a logo that, uh, that, that you want to build some solid geometry from, uh, we've got some great tools to help you do that. And so I'll show those techniques. I'm going to move into, a, throughout the session, a whole bunch of time-saving techniques. Um, you know, if you haven't been using mouse gestures, uh, introduce you to that to make sure that you're using that. It's one of the most efficient ways of interfacing with SolidWorks. If you figure you make thousands of clicks, you know, within SolidWorks per day, if you can save a bit of a second on each of those clicks, you're going to save a lot of time in getting things done. Um, going to cover things like copying features and sketches. A lot of folks are oftentimes not aware how easy it is to copy a feature from one model to another, copy sketches that you've already created and reuse stuff that you've done before. Uh, sketching shortcuts, uh, feature freeze, a new function that uh, everyone needs just to know about, especially if you have very complex models that take a long time to rebuild. And then smart mates is a topic that I always like to show because it's really a very efficient way to put parts, of some, uh, parts together in assemblies. And then a um, little side topic there of configuring dimensions for uh, your parts with multiple configurations. Uh, it's a bit of an easy and straightforward interface for creating and managing your configurations. I'm actually going to spend some time in drawings. This is a topic that we oftentimes just overlook, and it turns out, of course, at least 90% of you create drawings. And we get, you know, we, we get so 
thrilled about all the great modeling techniques and assembly techniques where drawings are often overlooked. So I want to give you some guidelines, some real good workflows for creating drawings and how to use your model item dimensions rather than just putting dimensions up. There's some great techniques for that. A lot of folks abandon that when they just kind of get a mess of dimensions up on their drawing. And there's really a very systematic way of getting those up on your drawing and just using the, the information that's already in your model. I'll talk a little about custom properties and the um, interface you have for editing those custom properties and how it relates to title blocks and, um, again, uh, configurations on your drawing sheet. So that pretty much sums up what I, what I want to show. So with that, I think uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, take a jump into SolidWorks here. Let everyone's screens refresh there. And some of you who attended our race to production events will recognize this. And I'm, I'm going to base some of my techniques and stuff on, uh, on this design. It's, it's kind of what we've done before. If you didn't attend one of those events, well, then this is, this is new to you. But this is actually a little toy robot. Okay, we have an assembly here. It's not complete yet. We've got some things we want to finish up. So one of the things that I want to do is build solid geometry that captures, you know, a, a company's logo that we that we've got is just a simple picture that we want to bring in here. And I'm going to actually place it on this top uh, half of the part here, so we're just going to open that up in its own window. Now, before we start to model up the logo on here, that's basically a, just a picture of a logo that we're going to turn into solid geometry, I want to point something out to you all. It's on the left-hand side in your feature manager. You'll notice that there's little locks on all the features in this model um, all the way down at the bottom. There's a function in 2012 called Feature Freeze, and this is most useful for those of you who have very complex models, and they take a long time to rebuild. And as you start to make modifications to the model, oftentimes it forces a rebuild of several of the features, and you're waiting for it to rebuild before you can continue on. We have this great uh, um, new, new function here called Feature Freeze, where you can take the Feature Freeze bar and position it anywhere in the Feature Manager, and you are then in total control of what rebuilds. So if I place it at the bottom, nothing rebuilds until I click on the rebuild light. So it won't automatically rebuild any of those features. This really comes into play when you do a lot of top-down assembly and uh, component design work where you have something driving features in another component, and then that other part has to rebuild. Well, this will stop that from happening. Or if you frequently make use of layout sketches or even layouts and assemblies, again, that will force, typically it forces rebuilds in the, and the children components. So now this puts you in total control of the rebuild process, and that can save you a lot of time. So um, I'm taking advantage of this in this part, even though it doesn't have a lot of features yet. Another thing I need to show you is where you find that. So I've got the options screen up right now, and then you'll see this down here where it says enable freeze bar. So if you currently don't have that and you're using 2012, you'll just want to put a check mark right here. I'm kind of hovering my mouse over it right now. Okay. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, deal with what we're, uh, what we're talking about. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, create a sketch here. And in SolidWorks, we have the ability to insert a sketch picture. So I've got the button hip up here on my toolbar to insert a sketch picture. And one of the neat things that, um, that uh, we like to talk about frequently, but it's, it's, it's just very important that you understand is, Using uh, Enterprise PDM, um, Enterprise PDM actually integrates itself into um, Windows Explorer. So anytime I'm in an open dialog, whether I'm in SolidWorks or any other application, I basically have access to all of my great um, Vault functions. And here I'm actually browsing into my Vault, but it, it's very invisible to the user. It's one of the things we really like about ePDM. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that because we have an entire presentation that will cover that thoroughly. Uh, later today. But one of the things that you'll notice I've done here, I've said I want to insert a sketch picture. It's opened up the browser, and I'm really browsing into my vault. Now, it's pretty much invisible to me, except I have some nice, you know, useful information here, and that's one of the things I really like about Enterprise PDM is its integration into Windows makes it so that for the typical user, it's just sort of invisible that we're using this great controlled environment because I can just do things very normally, or I can take advantage of functions like the integrated search tools. So here I am in my open dialog box, yet I want to search for something. And you'll notice that there's all kinds of ways I can search. I can find documents that are in a particular workflow state. I can quickly get a view of what's waiting for approval. And again, you'll see a lot of this later. But 
I know that there's this image for a company, and it's, it's, you know, it's got the name logo in the file name somewhere, so I'm just going to type in logo and hit enter, and it instantly finds something um, with the word logo in the file name for me. I can click on it here, and before I even bring it in, the preview within this interface will show me and preview just over you know, 250 different types of documents. And at least now, by just looking at that logo, I can verify, yeah, that's the one that we want to bring in here. It's just a picture and build some geometry with that. So we'll go ahead and complete that process. And here it's in my model. It's really giant right now, but not too worried about that because um, I really want to use this just to create some sketch geometry. And then I'll work with my sketch geometry to get it positioned and sized properly. But you'll notice over here there's some controls for what you can do with the picture. So if I wanted to just do something simple like rotate this thing 90 degrees, I can just type in an angle and I can position it and scale it anywhere I want. But the real challenge here is how do I create sketch geometry based on that picture? Well, there's a little known option in SolidWorks called Auto Trace, and it's an add-in. And I'm going to go to my add-ins menu now to show you where it is. And it just sits right down here under SolidWorks add-ins, and I'm going to turn it on. And the way you access the Auto Trace functions is you go back into Edit Picture Mode, which is done by just double-clicking with this uh, within the sketch picture. And my interface on the left-hand side here has changed slightly. You'll notice I now have uh, basically, uh, uh, the next menu I can go to, so it's kind of like wizard-based. This is these functions here, just for editing the size and scale of the picture. The next window takes me to my auto trace functions, and a real simple way to use this is just to go over here to the probe tool, and I'm going to go ahead and click inside of this color region, which is a white color region bordered by black. And then I come over here and click on Begin Trace, and it will trace around the border of that color region and create sketch geometry for me. Down here, I've got all kinds of adjustments if I want to do some refinement of that. As I change the brightness, the sketch geometry dynamically updates for me. So there we go. I pretty much am done with uh, creating the sketch based on that logo. Let me go ahead and, hot and just uh, suppress the picture so we can see the sketch geometry that we have here. Oops, don't want to rename. Okay, so there it is. <clears throat> now, I need to move that sketch and scale it and such. Now, one of the um, other lesser-known functions with uh, Instant 3D is the ability to just move and scale sketches that have no constraints on them, like this one. So if I wanted just to scale the sketch down, I could easily just grab the corner of it and drag it around. I also have the ability, of course, just to shove it anywhere that I want. I want to get it over here on this little, call it the, the, the little wing of this design here, and just continue to work it till it's positioned and scaled. Uh, where it's going to work out for me. So let's bring it down just a little smaller. Okay, that's pretty good. So my next challenge now is actually creating a feature, a solid feature. What I want to do is I just want to create an indent of that logo on this tipped wing here at this odd angle. So a lot of you might be thinking, okay, now he's going to show us how to create additional reference planes and maybe move the sketch onto that reference plane. Well, it's not really all that complex. What I'm going to do here is I'm, I'm just going to basically grab the sketch, and instantly go into my Extrude Cut Feature tool. And one of the options you have in your Extrude features is the ability to begin the extrusion from a different plane other than the sketch plane. That just happens to be the default condition. So what I'm going to do is say, no, no, let's begin the extrusion at some offset above the part. And then for the direction and how to terminate these, this extrude, I'm going to say we're going to offset it from a surface by some small amounts so it makes a little indentation. I'll pick the uh, face that I want to offset it from. Of course, we'll reverse it so it cuts into that surface, and we're done. And there it is indented into that wing without moving that sketch around. Very simple to do. Now, in SOLIDWORKS, you're also going to find that um, to reuse geometry from one part into another part or just within a single part file, uh, you can copy and paste features. You can copy and paste sketches. It's just done with simple Windows commands. So if I wanted a copy of this sketch, I can select it. You can't see what I'm doing, but I'm typing in Control-C, Windows standard for copying a sketch. And I'm going to choose this top plane and type in Control-V, and I have a simple copy of that sketch. Let's look at a top view of this. The reason I copied is just so I can get a, another feature on this side. And I didn't want to use the mirror tool because the letter G then would be mirrored. It would look kind of funky. So I really just want the same sketch on this side. Now, what I didn't explain earlier that I'm going to explain now is how quickly I got into the extrude cut feature. And, and this is something that you should all be taking advantage of. And that's mouse gestures. This is this little wheel of fortune that you see fly up on my menu. I basically uh, activate it with the right-hand 
mouse button click, and then I can just go in and let me just cancel the command now and put my cursor on whatever function that I want to what, that I want to use, and then release the mouse button. It's a very quick way to interface with SolidWorks, and the reason I bring that up is because if I can get to the commands that I use 80% of the time in a quicker way, it's going to save you a lot of time, so you ought to get used to using that. It's one of the most efficient user interfaces out there. So that, combined with shortcut menus, will pretty much, you know, avoid... Um, all the hassle of going to toolbars and menus or your command manager. You can just activate everything from shortcuts and mouse gestures. Now, the mouse gesture um, wheel that you see here and all the functions that you program onto it, you can customize this very easily through the customized menu. Um, each, each one of those menus is unique for sketch mode, part mode, assembly, and drawing mode. So you have up to eight buttons that you can put on there for each. All right, so anyway, let's go back to my extrude cut again and we're going to basically do the same thing again, so it's a bit of a repeat here. Let's go ahead and get that distance. We're going to offset from this face and reverse that. Okay. I want to splash a bit of a, some color in there. So you know, when, you, when you select uh, features in SolarWorks, you have the option in your flyout toolbar to go straight to your appearance menu. You don't have to go to an appearance toolbar or the um, appearance pane that's available over here in the feature manager area. You can just click right here. And then when you're in your appearance um, menu, you want to choose what you're assigning the appearance to, you know, the entire body or just the cut features that we've selected. So we'll always give you those types of choices. And I'm just going to splash some Go Engineer green into these uh, little indented logo areas there. So there we've created some nice geometry based on our company's logo. Um, continuing on that, on that theme, I'm going to um, resize my windows here just a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and go back up to the top level assembly. And the next thing that we want to design that's going to fit into here is, um, is, is a little device that we want to snap into the holes that we see on the bottom of the, uh, the, well, the battery cover down here. And this, this is going to be a device for this little toy robot to steer it around and pick up, like, you know, ping pong balls and stuff like that. Um, the concept is currently only exists as just drawn on a piece of scrap paper. And what we've done is we've just taken a picture of that scrap paper with our camera phone. And from that, we're going to, try, we're going to attempt to go ahead and build the entire model here. So let's watch how that's done. I'm just going to start out by creating a brand new part in this case. Okay, I'm going to sketch on the top plane, and again, insert a sketch picture. I happen to have this image that we took a picture of just sitting right here in the same location as my logo, and we can preview it. You can see that it was just drawn on some scrap grid paper here, and it's really sloppy, um, you know, just, just kind of a bunch of sketched in, penciled in line work of the, uh, the basic shape. So it's got the top view and then the cross section, what we want it to look like so it can easily pick up uh, those ping pong balls I was talking about. And again, I'm sitting here previewing that picture um, because of the preview functions that are available in the Enterprise PDM Vault. All right, let's zoom out a little bit and talk about how you could use this to actually create real sketch and dimension geometry over something as sloppy as a picture like this. Well, this time I'm not going to use auto trace. It really wouldn't apply. There's just, you know, again, too much slop in here to try to auto trace that. And I really want to just create my own sketch geometry so it modifies easily with dimensions. You'll notice there's already a given dimensional length in here of 7 and, and an 8. So what I recommend doing is actually just begin by drawing a line at that length. And I'm going to go ahead and align it down here with my, my origin. And I'll even throw a dimension on here uh, just to get this thing sized up properly so we can see what 7 and 8 really looks like at scale relative to the sketch picture. So the next step is then to just um, edit the picture. You double click on it and you move it around and position it where you want to start sketching on and you can scale the picture as well just by dragging a corner or you can come over here and you can actually type in you know a scale height or width or whatever you need. I'm going to go ahead and take this and we can see that that, uh, that's, that pretty well matches 7 and 8 so that registers nicely. But what I'm doing is I'm going to take the, uh, the center of, 
of that little trap area there and get it aligned with the origin so I have nice datum references uh, to use for drawing my shape. Okay, so I'm done editing the picture geometry and I'm going to get rid of my temporary uh, sketch uh, line there that I use just to register uh, the size of my picture and begin doing some real sketching here. So my sketch in this case is going to start out with a line that just reaches across here and I'm going to change that into a center line font. little trick I usually do if I have a combination of solid lines and center lines is I pretty much stay in the solid line tool and I just come over here and say well this particular segment is for construction and now it changes it to a center line font and we're going to use that for um, keeping this thing symmetric. Alright so my next line segment is just a shorty here and the next thing I want to draw is a tangent arc. For those of you who don't know, when you're in the line tool, you can easily transition from straight lines to tangent arcs by just taking the, uh, your cursor and returning it to the start point of the current segment. So here I go, and then exit that start point in the direction where you want the tangency, and it automatically switches to a tangent arc. I'll go ahead and place the arc endpoint about right here, and, uh, and we'll do the same thing again. I, accidentally got out of the line tool. Sorry about that. Let's go back to it again. You'll see the same thing here again. I'm really in the line tool. I need an arc here. We'll bring it up. And I'm looking at my cursor feedback. I now want a tangent segment. So of course you see the little yellow tangent indicator there. Zoom out a little bit here and bring a final line segment up to the top like that. Go straight to the dimension tool. You'll see how easy it is using those mouse uh, uh, gestures that I was talking about. Now I want an overall dimension. I'm only going to draw half of this shape right, right here. And I'm, I only need to follow this one profile because we're going to take this profile that we see here as, as a section that we sweep along this geometry that I've just drawn. So the next thing we want to do is just give this thing an overall size and we'll grab this point up here. Even if I'm not creating a revolved part, I frequently use the technology in SolidWorks that enables me to double the dimension. If you select a center line and geometry, you just move your cursor below the center line and it doubles the dimension and then I'll type in the overall size that we want for the part matching what the sketch was indicating down here. I'm going to show you guys a few more tricks on dimensioning sketches. Um, nothing much there. This one here I'm going to uh, just double that one up. Now here's what I want to do. I, I want to control the overall opening that we have between these two arcs here that I'm just kind of moving my cursor up up and over there, uh, which means dimensioning to the tangency of the arc. Now, a lot of you know that you can put in your dimension. If I select the center line and I select the arc right now, it's going to automatically dimension to the arc center. If you know you want to dimension to the arc tangency before selecting the arc, make sure you simply hold down the shift key, which is what I'm doing right now. I know you can't see it. Then select the arc and it automatically dimensions to the tangency of the arc. Take notes if you didn't know that. It's a really great shortcut. Saves you a lot of time. And then we'll just, of course, type in the size. Okay, if you missed that first one, I'm going to do it again for the uh, this area right here. We'll bring it down and get our size that we want. And some of these other dimensions, there's pretty standard stuff here. We'll just put in a dimension there. I want to control the angular opening here. And then we'll put in um, oh, a distance for the top. Oh, that wasn't it. Let's get the right one there. Okay. Um, actually forgot the, uh, the, the, the fillet right here. Again, I'm going to go to my mouse gestures, type in some guesstimate of a radius here. Another little trick with fillets is you can actually grab that little preview, and you can literally just drag that around and resize a fillet. In case you didn't know that, so I can sit here and just slide it around so it looks approximately correct. And I'm going to come over here and key in a nice even number of one inch and get that fillet in there. And we'll just add one more dimension, a little length of that line segment there. And that completes that sketch. We're going to pop out of that. The next thing we want to develop is this cross section that we're going to use to sweep along here. So we'll, uh, we'll choose the front plane to draw that geometry on and then go straight to my line tool and pick up on the endpoint of the previous sketch right there. Bring a line up, over, control this with some dimensions, okay. and get the overall that uh, 
that little uh, roughed out sketch said we wanted this thing about half an inch high. We'll control the angle in here as well. Okay. Um, I want to round that inside off with a fillet. Let's go ahead and put a fillet in there. That looks good. And then we'll offset the geometry. By the way, right here what you're looking at is the shortcut menu. So your shortcut menu, similar to the mouse gestures, um, are unique for parts, assemblies, drawings, and sketches. And you can put whatever buttons you want into this shortcut menu, and you can make this as big as you want. You'll notice I actually have a lot of flyout toolbars sitting in my shortcut menu, so a lot of these buttons will double as, you know, for many functions. Anyway, I'm going to use it now just to create a simple offset. Reverse that to the other side, and I'm going to cap off my section with a couple of lines. I want this one in the vertical direction, this one horizontal across here. Go straight to the trim tool and lop that geometry off right there. Now, I know that um, over the webcast that uh, some of the uh, efficiency of, of drawing that shape might have been lost, but really I was getting to all of my commands through shortcuts and mouse gestures. I suggest you get used to that because you can see how efficient it is. I wasn't, you know, move, you know, traveling my cursor all around my screen, picking different menus. I could get to all of those functions very quickly. And it doesn't take long for your brain to memorize where you program those buttons to get to them fast. So that's a, one of my biggest suggestions um, you know, when you're sketching is to get used to, or actually in, in doing anything in SolidWorks, is get used to those shortcuts. I'm going to go ahead and uh, suppress this picture so you can see what we've got right now and go ahead and just create a sweep. I've got my profile and my path. Sweep is complete. Okay. Um, I, I do need to modify the geometry a little bit. Looking at a top view here, we didn't intend this to have an angle up here, so we're going to take care of that with a simple cut. Just place a line segment in here. I'm on the wrong sketch plane, my mistake. <laughs> okay. And like I said, a simple line segment in here is all we need to create a cut. Another little tip here. I'm in the sketch. I want to get out of the sketch, create a cut, or maybe I just want to exit the sketch. In case you don't know, you can just double click where you have nothing and that takes you out of a sketch. To edit a sketch, you can just double click on sketch geometry. So here I've just gone into the sketch, out of the sketch a couple of times. Um, very, very quickly. Anyway, the next thing we want to do is create a cut. I can easily lop off the end of that with just a single line segment. It doesn't have to be an enclosed boundary if I'm just going to use that line segment as like a cutting plane. Just think of a big saw blade that I've just uh, knocked that off of there with. Okay, I've got some fillets to put in here. I do fillets all the time, so I just have those on my uh, mouse gesture menu. And let's key in a different size for the fillet. When you select a face, it will actually attempt to fill at all edges of the selected face. You can see how much work I've done already. And, of course, I have tangent propagation turned on, so it went ahead and propagated that fillet all the way up around here. I do want to pick up on this vertical corner, and then I'm done with that fillet. Next thing we want to do is just mirror this geometry over. It's a symmetric part, so we're going to mirror around this face. But pay close attention to what I'm mirroring. I'm not going to go in here and select individual features to mirror we have an option to mirror the entire body, which collects up every feature in the model and mirrors it as a single body. And we're going to continually take advantage of that as we begin to modify the part. The next thing we need to add to this is, are some bosses that will help enable it to snap into the battery cover on the assembly that we are looking at. Uh, I'm going to draw those on the top plane here. It's just a couple of circles just to get the boss started. Okay. Uh, I want to make those circles equal in size, I can just window select around them, saves me the hassle of holding down my control key, and when you window select around them, it'll come up with the relationships menu, it's okay, you guys are the same size, so I just click on the equal sign there. Um, and a great uh, little tip here, when you have simple sketches like this, I take advantage of what of the function called fully defined sketch, okay? I've got the fully defined sketch shortcut on my shortcut menu sitting here, and when you click on this, it will actually calculate and determine for you, based on your sketch geometry, any missing relationships, and it will add them automatically, and it will add the dimensions in. And you have different dimensioning schemes you can choose from. 
and then you can choose where your dimensioning origin is located. Here it's just using the um, origin of the part itself, which is fine. Now for simple sketches, I use this a lot because it's a very, very quick way to get your dimensions up on the screen, and you'll see them fly up there instantly. And even if I don't like the dimensioning scheme it came up with, you can very easily, for the most part, modify your dimensioning scheme. For example, I really want to dimension the circles center to center, so I'll take this dimension and just drag its, its witness line up to the center of this arc here. Center of that arc there, and then just modify the dimension. So we'll make that 0.8, we'll make this 0.4. Um, another little trick here. If um, you notice, I've just, I'm dimensioning um, from the origin to the center here, but I know what I want for the, over, for the spacing over to the other side. You can actually type equations right into your modify dialog box. For example, I want 1 in the 3 8 total distance, so I'll just type in divide by 2 right here in my modify dialog box, and it calculates that for me. All right, so let's key in our diameters there. And again, I'm going to take advantage of what, you were what I was showing you earlier. I really want the bosses to begin their extrusion half an inch above the part. So I'm going to come over here and say, okay, let's begin the bosses by half an inch up here. And then we're going to extrude them up to the body. So there was no need to reposition my sketch plane. I just said, well, begin the boss up at, at this level here. This is a plastic part. We're going to go ahead and add some draft to those and finish that off. Um, I, want, I, I want all of the um, intersections here to have nice rounded corners and fillets since it's a plastic part. Uh, you can easily copy features like fillets and bosses and other stuff with typical Windows functions. If I wanted to copy a fillet, what you would do if you have Instant 3D turned on is you'd select the fillet, and then you see that little sphere right there? I'll let the uh, video refresh there a little bit on your end. That little sphere right there, you basically just hold down your control key, grab a hold of that, and then drag it over to where you want a copy of the fillet. Here I just dragged and dropped it onto the surface, and then every uh, sharp edge of that surface gets that a copy of that fillet. Again, a super efficient way of making copies of existing geometry so you're not going to menus and you know going through the extra steps required to do that. All right, um, at the top of each one of these bosses, I want to create a little snap hook. I don't really have to create that feature. It might consist of three features. I might have to make some extruded geometry, make a cut into it. Uh, I might then need to add some draft to it. Well, instead of doing all of those functions, um, the SOLIDWORKS has a whole, uh, has a collection of what we call fastening features. These are predefined features. I have it here on my shortcut menu. So I've got the fastening feature flyout toolbar. And you can see we've got things that are predefined for predefined mounting bosses, snap hook, the snap hook groove, uh, vent feature, and um, a tool to create a lip groove in mating uh, shells of a plastic design. Anyway, let's go to the snap hook. It's really simple to use. I want to position it on the top of this boss. And then we have some orientation selections that we want to choose over here. So I want to say that this thing is going to be, uh, its direction is perpendicular to the top plane, and it faces away from the right plane. And that, that now repositions the feature the way I want it. And then down here you can see you've just got a whole a little diagram here to key in your, your dimensions. So, so I wanted to change the, the bottom width of it. I'll zoom in here a little further uh, so you can see what effects my changes have. It dynamically updates it for you. So if I come in here and change this to, let's say, oh, 25,000, so you can see that it uh, instantly updates your preview. Um, one other thing I want to point out, if you start to use some of these fastening features and you find yourself using a, you know, similar sizes all the time, you have a favorites menu. You can establish favorites, so then you don't have to key in all these values uh, each time you create those. All right, we'll go ahead and complete that. We want to do a simple mirror of this feature, and this time it is just a mirror of the feature, so we just get that onto the other boss. Now, if we look at the model, you're going to notice that uh, the model um, uh, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a symmetric model. Remember the mirror feature we created earlier, the mirror body? I can just take that now and just drag it to the bottom of the tree so it actually collects up all of those features to mirror. So again, the one mirror feature can pick up everything that we have on here. 
Part's looking pretty good. Uh, we want to make sure that we assign a proper material for it. Later we might do a simulation on it, or we just want it to look right. We want the crosshatch pattern to be right. We want our mass properties to be reported correctly. So I want to give you some tips on um, the SOLIDWORKS materials. When you go and right-click here and edit materials, you have your predefined SOLIDWORKS materials. And I get asked this all the time, you know, Mark, well, you know, your, um, your polyethylene uh, uh, material property, I need, I, need to make, I need to make a change for it. I uh, need to make a change to it. You know, some of the material properties need to be uh, tweaked slightly. I don't like the default appearance. Or I don't like the crosshatch pattern. Well, what you want to do in that case is uh, you're not going to be able to change the supplied SOLIDWORKS material, just edit here in the, in, in the, um, in the default material library. You're going to want to simply right-click on it and copy it. And then you can paste it and create your own categories of materials, either create a new library or create a new material or just paste it and then edit that. Once you've done that, then you can start to collect up your own custom materials that meet your requirements and preferences. For example, here I've got ABS Go Engineer Green, and you'll notice we've changed the appearance so it's going to be a green color. I've got a nice crosshatch pattern on it. And another tip is if there's materials you, you find yourself using all the time, because a lot of us use about a dozen materials all the time, um, you want to make sure you right-click on that material and add it to your favorites list. Okay? So once it's added to your favorites list, you can come in here and right-click on material and just choose the material from that little shortcut list right there without going into the material library. All right, let's save this part off. And I believe I'm just going to overwrite the, uh, the old one that I had here. Overwrite that. Okay, and we need to get that into our assembly. Um, I want to tile up my windows. So right up here, if you notice where I'm hovering my cursor, I've got these um, uh, tile to right and left buttons now in SOLIDWORKS, which make it really convenient for tiling up your open documents. So now I've got both documents open. I'm going to zoom in a little bit to the assembly window, the part window a little bit. And I want to show you the most efficient way to assemble this component into, um, into the top level here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to grab this part by this circular edge. And this is what, what, this is what we're, we call smart mates. When I grab the part by the circular edge and then drag the part into my assembly window, it's actually looking for a circular edge underneath my cursor's position. In this case, it found one, and what it's going to add are two mates for me. It's going to make the cylindrical surfaces concentric to each other and the flat faces coincident to each other. The only thing I have to do is just drop it into place. Mates are added. That is a super efficient way to put your parts together. I still have to define, you know, where the other post goes. I'm going to rotate it around just a little bit. Let the screen refresh on your end so you can see that uh, rotated part. Okay. And once a part is already in the assembly, to use the Smart Make technology, what you're going to want to do is hold down your Alt key, grab a piece of geometry from one part, and just drag it over on top of, in this case, another cylindrical surface. And you can see the, the cursor feedback is indicating that it's going to make a concentric mate and drop it there. Now, a, a toolbar will pop up for you. And I use these smart mates all the time, even if the default mate condition isn't the one I was after. Maybe I really wanted it to be perpendicular, parallel, or at some distance. I can override the default right now in this menu that comes up here. In this case, this is what I want, so I'm going to go ahead and accept that. And the part, in just no time with very little effort, is totally assembled in there. All right, I've only got a few more minutes here. What I want to do is show you some tips on creating a drawing of the part that, uh, that we designed here. So I've got the part open, and I'm going to go into my um, new document pull-down menu and tell it that I want to make a new drawing out of this. And I'll choose a drawing sheet to use. I'm going to go ahead and choose... Uh, Seaside sheet. And one of the things that I, I, I actually am, am pretty much a proponent of using the model dimensions in the drawing when you've, when you've created model dimensions that make sense for tolerancing and, uh, and, and your dimensioning scheme within a drawing, in which this case it, it will apply. But I want to show you my preferred technique for doing that. Instead of dragging and dropping a view in from my view palette and at the same time bringing in those, those, those um, model dimensions, I prefer to do that as a secondary step. So what I'm going to do is just bring uh, this view into my drawing sheet. 
And I really don't need any of my projected orthographic views. I might put a 3D view up here. Those are kind of handy to have. And then I'll first thing I do is just kind of adjust the display of my views. So I'm going to go into this view. Um, I'm going to remove the tangent edges. We don't need to see those. And then I'd like to look at my model and determine, well, what other views am I going to need to document this part? And I can see here that I would really benefit from a section view. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly create a section view here. A little tip here, um, when you create views that like to automatically align like this section view, before I click to place this view, I really don't need it aligned. Hold down your control key, move your cursor off to the side, and it will follow your cursor and break the alignment as you create the section view. So that's a really uh, efficient way just to get that view laid out where you want it. Now, in looking at the section view, I'm also going to need a detail view. So we'll go in here and just uh, specify where we want that detail view and place that on our drawing sheet as well. A little shortcut to scaling detail views is you can actually edit the text. So I'm going to edit the scale here just in the text callout for the view and say I want that detail view at 4 to 1, and it updates it for me. I also want a detail view um, to help me uh, define where those posts are positioned, and we'll place that detail view up here on the sheet as well. So once I get most of the views that I kind of predetermined that I'm pretty sure I'm going to need, then I go into the dimensioning process. And what I like to do is, um, if I'm going to show model items, is go to my model items menu. And don't use entire model. I like to be, I like to systematically choose the features to add dimensions. And what I'm going to do is go to my top view and say, uh, I'm going to turn off the option here, import items into all views. I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, in this top view, place all the dimensions that make sense in that view uh, for this selected feature, and I get a nice subset of the dimensions. Then I can go into another view here, uh, for example, the detail view, and just select the, um, the little tab here, and we'll put the, put the dimensions in there as well. That happens to be the wrong tab, so I'll take care of that one later. Let's go in here and put in the dimensions for this feature. And that's looking pretty good. And how about the section view as well? We'll go ahead and put those dimensions in there as well. So there you can see I'm just picking features and in the views that I want to place those dimensions. The next thing you would do is just some simple cleanup. And, you know, if there's some dimensions that don't need to be seen in a particular view, you take care of that. And I'm going to go ahead and just move some of these out here because we do have the uh, section callout that's a bit in the way of some of these. And it takes only a little bit of editing, but in very little time, I pretty much... Um, I've got most of the drafting of this part done. And the other thing I want to show is if you're using um, any of our PDM tools, uh, when you do check in a document, it actually comes up with an interface with, a, with what we call a data card. And you can type in all the information that might be applicable to some of your title block text. Um, with or without a PDM tool, you also have another great function in SOLIDWORKS for getting this uh, stuff entered in here. And that's this button over here called Custom Properties. And I'm going to click here, and you'll see that, that I've already got set up a nice little form here. So I can say, oh, its current state is under edit, and it's work in process. And, you know, I can choose initials or type in my initials and pick a date that we've done this on. And I can say, you know, manufacturing has approved it. That's the approver and the date. Uh, QA has also got this thing approved. So rather than typing in all this information, making mistakes on dates and typos and things like that. Um, you can actually use this form that we have over here to get the information easily into the drawing. It, it's really driving custom properties. Okay, and then, uh, you know, this should be controlled by PDM, but if I want to re-establish that at first, and then when I click on Apply, the drawing title block text updates because I've got all of that linked to custom properties. Now, for your information, if you wanted to edit, uh, if, if you wanted to get to the form that creates this great interface, um, you'll find it in the Start menu under SolidWorks, okay? And then in SolidWorks, you'll see the SolidWorks tools. And you'll see this thing called Property Tab Builder, okay? And it looks like this, and it's an easy interface. I don't have time today to go into all the details on how you create this, but you're pretty much going to just drag group boxes over here for your interface. You're going to put in things like text boxes and list boxes and maybe... Uh, number boxes, and then when you click in one of these, you're going to put in a caption, you're going to put
input uh, on this line right here, what custom property it's going to drive, whether it's configuration specific or just the file property, and then the source and the type of information that goes into that, uh, into that box or whatever it is, or the pull-down list. Very easy to build. I'm going to go ahead and open the one that you were just looking at just to show you what that completed one looks like. So the one that you were just looking at was specifically for drawing files. You can have a separate one for part files and assembly files as well to drive custom properties into there. And like I said, when you're using a PDM system, it's going to take care of that stuff for you. Uh, whether you use PDM or not, it is a nice interface to get information as custom properties um, into your models, parts, and assemblies, or uh, your drawings, parts, and assemblies, as well as populate drawing title block text. So. Um, I hope uh, hope some of you will can take advantage of that. All right, it looks like I'm uh, about ready to wrap things up here. Um, I hope uh, hope you guys found some some good little tidbits of information there that that'll help you uh, do your designs. Um, we uh, we covered things like um, you know putting. Um, uh, sketch pictures into your models to create real live geometry out of it, and then uh, lots of little uh, techniques and stuff utilizing mouse gestures, shortcut menus, sketch shortcuts for getting your jobs done faster. Uh, I know a lot of you out there are already SolidWorks Wizard Level 18, and you know it's not new news to you, but hopefully even you were able to pick up a little tidbit here and there. And some of you hope, hopefully will be encouraged to take advantage of some of these uh, time-saving techniques. And then a little little tips on uh, the view creation as well. All right, so that concludes the SolarWorks demonstration part of this.